So our next speaker is Friedemann Senke from the Friedrich Nietzsche Institute. And he'll be talking about surrogate gradients as a link between connectivity and computational function in spiking neural networks. Right, thank you very much um, for hosting this session. Also, thanks a lot for the organizers, uh, to the organizers, even though I don't think they're in this session right now, but uh, it's really great to be part of this uh, conference. And I hope all the people who did tune in are well, despite the craziness in the world going on at the moment. And yeah, I'm happy to present um, basically a overview over the last, let's say three years of work on spiking neural networks and how we can link them to actually some of the methods that the previous speakers have introduced, which is end-to-end -end optimization to build uh, functional spiking neural networks that we can use uh, to study biology. Um, and the, the reason why we wanna do this is of course, because we like to understand the brain. So the, the brain implements complex functions and it does so with neural networks and these are spiking neural networks. And the one that takes in sensory inputs, computes complicated function on that and it, it churns out behavior uh, on the other end. Uh, and that's of course a very simplified view, but if you wanna model this in any uh, form, then you usually need to make approximations and simplifying assumptions. And for building such models, typically what we need to do is um, that we need to come up with an abstraction for the input, uh, which is meaningful and that we can still compare to data in the brain. Uh, similarly, we need to come up with abstractions for the output. Again, something that's meaningful and something that we can interpret. And then ultimately, and that's really the challenge um, that uh, where we take now a lot of inspiration from deep learning and machine learning, uh, you need to adjust the connections in your network to actually get a function in your neural network model. Uh, because otherwise you're comparing a random neural network with a functional one if you go to animal models and that's clearly uh, not the way forward. And um, in the past people have built these type of models by hand and clearly this is uh, reaching its limits uh, as networks get bigger and the functions you are actually exploring are getting more complicated. And nowadays my experimental colleagues record from, record from hundreds of neurons from behaving animals in parallel uh, that perform complicated tasks. So we really need a paradigm shift here also in spiking neural network modeling. And um, to, to explain this approach about the input abstraction, let's look at a simple example. So suppose you're an animal that has to solve a simple discrimination task with your whiskers, for instance, you have to discriminate between two types of textures uh, that you're whisking over. And uh, now it's, it's reasonable to assume for our input model that each whisk over a texture will generate a spatial temporal pattern of some spikes that reach your variable cortex. Similarly, a different texture, the blue one here, will create a different set of spikes. But now, of course, not two trials will generate the same kind of spike trains, but there will be certain statistics um, that are associated in these uh, spatial temporal patterns with the orange and the blue texture, and they will be different and they will rely on some kind of complex manifold in spike timing space. And, and, and what I'm showing you here, I'm using some synthetic data, but there are basically thousands of different implementations of these spike trains that correspond to these textures. So how do we solve this in a model? So at the output end, it's reasonable to assume that there's somewhere in the network, there should be neurons that know the answer uh, if the network really, if we claim the network should solve this task. And one way to do this is that we define some kind of readout unit in the network. Um, and the convenient way of doing this is that we say, okay, these are not now spiking neurons, but we just consider uh, the sub uh, membrane, uh, the sub threshold dynamics of the membrane dynamics of uh, some neuron. And let's say, uh, in this case, we could say, okay, uh, the fact that this blue neuron here uh, in its activity over time has a maximum here would signal maybe that uh, the blue pattern was present at the input, right? So that would be a very simple classification setup that we could start up with. And then of course, the question is, um, how do you build a network that does this? Uh, and the problem is that random networks cannot solve this problem in most cases. So if we write up a, a deep spiking neural network, if you want, with at least one hidden layer, uh, ideally more, um, then typically, uh, if this is randomly wired, you give different inputs corresponding to different textures, and the hidden layer in this case here wouldn't have any activity, um, and the readout would even do something wrong. So here the wrong neuron has the largest response in response to these, these inputs. So how do we do this optimization? And you can already see where the, where the journey is going, of course, uh, we've just seen uh, several examples in the previous talks with the, the, the machine learning approach to actually solving this problem. You need to learn somehow useful representations here in these hidden layers of these networks. Uh, and usually that's done in machine learning through end-to-end -end optimization. And end-to-end -end optimization hinges on computing gradients essentially, uh, or targets as we've just seen. 
Um, and it hinges on the idea that there's a differentiable loss function uh, that you can actually define over parameter space and that you can smoothly descend. Right. So first thing I think with, uh, the first thing that's important to notice is if you want to do this with spiking on networks is that there is time as a coding dimension. So time um, uh, is intrinsically there, meaning these uh, networks which, um, uh, yeah, uh, which basically are recurrent neural networks in the machine learning sense. And that means uh, that you can actually write the computation that, for instance, leads here to this uh, membrane uh, potential dynamics in this case of a leaky integrated fire neuron, which gets some synaptic input currents and some input spikes here at the bottom. Usually when you compute this or when you simulate this, the computation that goes into this can be summarized in this graph, which is now discretized in time. And that's basically what computer scientists would call unrolling in time of a recurrent neural network. So you have here you have the voltage state and state and time step one, the next time step, uh, it's slightly decreased by this factor of beta, uh, similarly it gets input through the current. And some people might be more familiar with writing this out as a forward Euler integration step for these dynamics, where you basically have these decay terms that link the next state in your dynamics with the previous state plus recurrent and feed forward synaptic inputs and so forth. And then ultimately at the output level, you generate spikes. And here, this is denoted by um, this uh, hemicide function, which basically now filters the membrane potential dynamics for this very simple leaky integrated fire neuron um, with a hard threshold that now tells you, okay, you emit a spike in a certain time step or you don't. And, and that's just to say that spiking neural networks are basically RNNs where they're very specific and, and, and implicit and also an explicit reference um, in them. And why is this good? Well, this is good because our friends from machine learning have worked out over years how to solve this, how to optimize such networks. There are known training procedures uh, for this. And for instance, there's real-time recurrent learning, RTRL, or there's back propagation through time, BBTT. Um, and a bunch of people have noticed this over the years and started actually using this um, to, to build um, network models. And I think one reassuring thing, I'm just going to flash this here quickly, is that you can compute gradients on these graphs. You can do this even with local learning rules with some additional approximations. But this is just a little sharper. But one thing that pops up in these equations here is this uh, problem of a derivative of a heavy side function. So in the end, it's all chain rule, as we know from computing gradients. And you usually end up with here in this product derivatives of a heavy side function. And that's really um, a huge problem for optimization because that derivative is usually zero or it's infinite. And if you have something at zero or infinite in a huge product, um, that creates clearly problems for the, what, the, what, the problem, what the product evaluates to. Right. And that's really a manifestation of the binary output character of spiking neurons. So if you have spiking neuron um, and there's only a very tiny change in the input current here between the black manifestation of the spiking neuron and the red one, one will spike, so it generates uh, a huge output, and the other one won't, which doesn't hit threshold. Uh, so no output at all. So it's really binary kind of output character. So and uh, people believe, uh, or, or people have known this for a long time that this is really a problem. Um, and in result, basically the optimization landscape looks uh, very flat in most places. So there are local minima almost everywhere, and gradient descent doesn't work because you don't cannot pick a direction anymore from something at zero or infinite. And um, people have thought about this for a long time, as I already said. And there's the, the many approaches that use, for instance, noise injection or actually pretending that spikes, uh, uh, that spikes are actually in, in fact differentiable, that's a, it's a more recent approach, uh, or that you actually know the hidden layer targets, which allows you to do some other optimization tricks. But the, um, the today's menu is basically, I'll, I'll convince you that we think surrogate gradients are a very promising way forward. And a bunch of my colleagues um, have also been working on this recently. And in machine learning, this has been known for a long time, actually mostly as straight through estimators um, for training binary neural networks. So we're using the same trick here, right? Um, and what got me really excited in this is that um, we realized relatively quickly that real neurons could actually do this. And I won't derive this here, but at the end of the day, the learning rules that come out of this are basically something that we would call in neuroscience a three-factor learning rule, where the update of a synaptic rate, IJ, a WIJ, is given by something that depends on the presynaptic activity with some kind of temporal kernel, a uh, nonlinear function of postsynaptic voltage and the feedback term. And the feedback term really encapsulates a lot of the spatial credit assignment that you've heard about in the previous talks. And I won't talk about this uh, too much, but there are biological plausible um, approaches to actually solve this uh, feedback too. 
So this is what we would usually call in neuroscience a heavy end type of plasticity is a correlation between pre and post. And then you have a voltage-based nonlinearity, which could be, in, for instance, implemented by calcium channels in real neurons. Um, moreover, uh, this needs to leave some kind of eligibility trace, which can be interpreted as a calcium transients, for instance, as a, as a spy. And finally, well, there is this third factor. And as I said, it was really nice to be in this session because there are now numerous biologically plausible approaches uh, to get this basically also in real time. Right, okay. Um, and now in our simple example, if we plug this in um, and we just want to solve a simple classification problem, then we, um, what we find is that basically the, uh, the true gradient doesn't give us anything, whereas if we use the surrogate gradient, this goes down, right? And that gives you then for this case, a network where you have rich hidden layer representations and spikes and the network solves the problem. And, and importantly, and right, and I think the, the hidden layer spike training doesn't look too unreasonable. And importantly, uh, you might ask, okay, um, so you know, Ellie is waving, I saw it. Does this mean two minutes left or no minutes left? More like no minutes, but like wrap it up. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so importantly, this also works um, with uh, different nonlinearities here. So the approximation, which approximation you're using, bottom line, which approxima approximation you're using doesn't matter. Um, so many different approximations work. That's very reassuring for biology. Uh, we can train this on a number of real-world data sets, such as speech recognition, recognition and um, uh, like MNIST and, and so forth, with competitive performance. And um, we, can, we can basically train neuromorphic, analog neuromorphic hybrid chips with this, um, which we do in collaboration with um, students at Heiberg. Um, and since I have to wrap up, I'm going to skip quickly through this. Um, so what I wanted to show you today is that really circuit gradients can link connectivity and function in spiking neural networks. They offer new opportunities to build uh, network models in computational neuroscience that yield plausible heavy and three factor learning rules. They're remarkably, remarkably robust and they empower neuromorphic hardware. <laughs> Thank you very much, Riedemann. Um, you guys, your timekeeping was not off at all, but you're just clearly way too interested in one another's work. Um, so if you've not been matched, definitely find some time in a Zoom room that is not going to kick you out to um, have a chat longer. But uh, we do have some questions. Um, do we? Yes, Arash, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Hi, sorry for keep bothering you. Uh, I was wondering, um, uh, you said that uh, neuron models are usually not differentiable and uh, like they don't work well. So uh, do you happen to know a model which is differentiable and works well for computing gradients? Like for example, LIF model doesn't work, right? It's not differentiable. Uh, so do you have better model? Um, so I mean, what I was trying to convey in this talk that it doesn't matter, uh, mm -hmm. you can still you can still resort to a surrogate gradient and it works just as well. And you don't actually have to have a differentiable model. Oh, perfect. So, so the, it does make any difference, right? Even if it's differentiable, it's not any better. So um, like not in my hands. I think this is ongoing research. Uh, people are looking into it, um, but spiking neurons, uh, in the way they are normally formulated are not differentiable. So there's nothing to compare to. Um, but if you make them differentiable, usually you, that means they also get an analog type of output value, not a binary one. Usually they do slightly better, but not much. Mm -hmm. Great. Alexander, just jump in there, please. Yeah, thanks for the super interesting talk. Um, you mentioned that it doesn't matter which nonlinearity you use for producing the surrogate um, gradients, but I was wondering, um, has anyone in biology already tried to measure which type of surrogate gradients the brain could be using, or is that difficult to... So, yeah, so this is what we were very excited about, thanks for the question, is that the fact that uh, usually in biology, uh, we know that calcium influx at the synaptic terminal actually determines the outcome of plasticity. And, uh, and it has a nonlinear activation, which looks roughly sigmoidal. So, and it's voltage dependent. So it's exactly right. And the, and the fact that it doesn't seem to matter how exactly this nonlinearity looks like, as long as it's nonlinear, and as long as it's voltage dependent, and as long as it's there, 
and biology could actually implement this. Okay, very cool. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we do. We're going to be kicked out in a minute, but if there's more questions, do go for it. Uh, apart from that, thank you so much to all our attendees today. Um, what an exciting panel of three very kindred minds. Um, thank you all so much, and well done for your presentations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I hope everyone enjoys their last day of Neuromatch conference.